Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from the Old Testament book of Joshua, and I'll be reading chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. This is the very last chapter of the book of Joshua, and this is what it says. Then Joshua said to the people, Now respect the Lord and serve him fully and sincerely. Throw away the gods that your ancestors worshipped on the other side of the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. But if you don't want to serve the Lord, you must choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. You may serve the gods that you, your ancestors worshipped when they lived on the other side of the Euphrates River, or you may serve the gods of the Amorites who lived in the, this land. As for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us those ears that hear your voice in our heart of hearts. And give us the bodies that respond. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. A little while back, I read a, a pretty funny dedication that was in the front of a book. It was a, a book by Joseph Rotman, and it said, To my wife, Margaret, and my children, Ella Rose and Daniel Adam, without whom the book would have been completed two years earlier. I thought that was pretty, <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. So I began to look at, at other books and, and some of their dedications. Tobias Wolf he wrote a dedication in the front of his book, and he said, To my first stepfather, who used to say that what I don't know could fill, fill a book, well... Here it is. You know, so often we see those dedication words in the front of a book where people begin what, what they tell the, the people that meant a lot to them. And that's the way we tend to think of book dedications. But Joshua's dedication is at the very last chapter of his book. It's the, at the end of his book. The... Joshua has dedicated his life to God since he was a teenager. When Joshua was a teenager, Moses told Pharaoh to let my people go. And Joshua was one of the slaves that went from Egypt to the promised land. They traveled about two weeks. And that's when Moses called the 12 tribes together. And he said, I want each of you 12 tribes to, to choose someone, choose a scout from your tribe. And those 12 men will go into the promised land and for 40 days, they'll scout out everything that, that God has promised to us that's in this land. 
the 40 days passed, and, and Joshua and Caleb were, were two of those 12. They were teenagers that had gone into the land for 40 days, and they came back, and they opened up their, their, their satchels and their, their sacks, and they poured out these grapes, and the people oohed and awed. They had never seen grapes so big. And then they, they poured out their satchels and said, and these are the figs that are in that land that God has promised. And the people oohed and They'd ne- never seen figs so big. And then they they opened up satchels and they had pomegranates. Well, people had never seen, I mean, they had lived as slaves. They had never seen anything like this before. And they oohed nod. And, and then the scout said, and there's one more thing there. The people, the people, they're huge. They looked at us and they thought we were grasshoppers. They, they were giants. I, they were so huge. So 10 of the 12 tribes, they said, well, well, there's no way we can receive what God has given us in this land flowing with milk and honey. If we go ahead and we kill Moses now, we can go back to Egypt. I mean, we've only been gone for two weeks. We can tell Pharaoh, you know, can't you use us as slaves now? We'll go back into slavery. Well, that's when Moses stepped in to intercede for those 10 who wanted to kill him. The only two that stuck with Moses It was Joshua and Caleb and their tribes. That Joshua said, if if God says this this is promised to us, we should go in. And the 10 10 of the 12 tribes wanted to go back to Egypt. Well, Moses did intercede for those 10, and God granted mercy. But just because there was mercy given doesn't mean there weren't consequences for their bad decision. And the consequences were that rather than going into the the promised land, they were to spend 40 years in the wilderness, a year for each day that the scouts were in the promised land. And it was in those 40 years, wandering in the wilderness, following God as a a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of, of fire by night, that the people went from being no people to being God's people. And when it came time 40 years later to go in to the promised land, only Joshua and Caleb were left of the original slaves. The others were the children of those slaves. And it was Joshua and Caleb who had dedicated their lives early on to God, they were the ones that led the people into the promised land. Well, just because they led them into the promised land didn't mean that everything was going to be hippy-skippy and just easy as pie. No, there were 30 battles that Joshua went through. And at the end of those 30 battles, at the end of a lifetime, trusting God, he says it's time for you to choose that you've seen the power of God leading through the wilderness in the hard time. You've seen the power of God leading through the battles. Now it's your time to choose. And he says, as for me and my family, we choose to serve the Lord. But before Joshua ever fought that first battle there in the, the land that God had promised them, he had to fight another battle. He had to fight the battle on the inside. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. We read from the last chapter of the book of Joshua. Now from the first chapter of the book of Joshua. Joshua 1, 6. God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous for you shall give this this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Joshua 1, 7. Be strong and very courageous. Joshua 1, 9. Have... I not yet commanded you to be strong and courageous. Joshua 1.18, only be strong and courageous. Four times in the first 18 verses, God says to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Why? Because he wasn't strong, because he wasn't courageous. You don't tell somebody to be strong and courageous if they're already strong and courageous. That God was equipping Joshua with exactly what he would need to lead these people into the promised land. That he had to fight that battle on the inside, that battle of fear. Well, why? Because fear, fear, fear will rob us of what God has already promised us. 
read a story about Red Arbach. He was a coach of the Boston Celtics. That's a basketball team for those who don't follow sports. And many years ago, and they were really excited about their number one draft pick. It was a young man named Billy Green from Colorado State. He had been an All-American. He was not only good, he was 6'6", he was good defensively, and he was a good point producer as well. And they were really excited about him. He entered into training camp as a rookie, and training camp was great. Well, at the end of training camp, uh, Billy Green went to the coach, Red Arbach, and said, I want to help set up my, my travel schedule for the games. And the coach said, well, you don't need to worry about that. We've got this travel schedule all set. We'll fly from destinations from here, and we'll set up your travel. He said, no, 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 no. I, I'm afraid to fly. I need to travel by train. Well, if he traveled by train, he wouldn't be able to make most of the games away from Boston. <laughs> so they had to cut him from the team. That Billy Green had gotten the contract he had always wanted. He was playing in the, in the pros, in the NBA, the dream that he'd always had. But fear, it was fear that kept him from, from what he had already been given. And that's the way fear is, that it's a battle. It's a battle that all of us fight on the inside. But it's a battle that Jesus won on the cross for you and for me. That on the cross, he took all those things that would destroy us. He took fear. He took sin. He took shame. He took all of the things that would separate us from God and he nailed them to the cross to take away their power. When he rose from the grave, he rose to give that, that power, the power of his Holy Spirit to you and to me. It's the same power, the same spirit that was given to Joshua. That in the New Testament, Paul is talking to a young man named Timothy. And he wrote a letter to him. In the second letter, 2 Timothy, in the very first chapter, he says to Timothy, God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. That's the spirit that, that Jesus gives to you and to me, his Holy Spirit. It's a, a spirit that, that's stronger than we are. It's a spirit that goes to battle when, when we're too weak. It's a spirit that we have to rely on, to trust in, to grab hold of his strength and his power. And it's a spirit that's available to you today. And it's a spirit that we, we choose. We choose. We choose to fight that battle on the inside. And we're not alone fighting that battle. We're fighting that battle with the one who's who's already conquered fear, already conquered death. And he gives that victory to you and to me. So choose today. Choose today to fight that battle on the inside and know that you're not alone. Second thing that I want to talk about this morning, that Joshua not only fought the battle on the inside, that Joshua had to fight the battle on the outside as well. When Joshua and the other 12 scouts went into the promised land, the land that, 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 that God had already promised them, and they began to scout around, they saw, yes, the, the people really did have spears. Yes, the people really did have swords. Yes, the, the people really did have shields, and the people really were huge. They were much bigger than they were, but they weren't too big for God. It didn't mean that, that everything was just going to be easy and they were going to slide on in the promised land and there was not going to be any battle, that everything that God had promised, it was just, just going to be easy. No. It didn't mean it was going to be easy at all. That baked into this life, this journey of life, is, is hardship. What's a part of what we deal with every day is heartache. What we deal with in this life is, is suffering. 
first church I ever served. I was a senior in college, and it was a little church down in LaGrange, Georgia, called Dixie United Methodist Church. Now, they don't name churches Dixie anymore. But it was a part of the Dixie Mill Village that was down there in, in LaGrange, Georgia. My next door neighbors, they had lived in that, that, that neighborhood for, for a long, 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 long time that my next door neighbor, he was the treasurer of the church and his name was Obi, Obi Jeter. And they don't name people Obi anymore. His wife was Tippy May and they don't name people Tippy May anymore. Well, Obi and Tippy May were the most wonderful neighbors ever to have. He was full of joy and full of life. He was an old man and he would come over and invite me sometimes to, 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 to have milkshakes with him. He had bought a Sunbeam milkshake maker that he was really proud of. And he'd invite me over and we'd sit in his kitchen and, and drink milkshakes. I loved it because Obi would tell stories. Not only were the milkshakes great, but his stories were wonderful. And, and Obi talked really, really fast. He was really funny and he stuttered when he went along. Well, that added to the story. You wanted to lean in to, to listen to what Obi said. And he was known in the whole neighborhood as, as one of the most joy-filled, funny people and loved to tell stories and, and, and get people people going with the stories. Well, one of the stories that he told me sitting around his kitchen table was when he was a boy. He said the principal of his school required that every student have a, a verse from the Bible that they memorized. And any time during the day that the, the principal turned to any, any child in the school, he said, what's your verse? And they would have to say, well, Obi got with the other boys. He said, fellas, he said, I stutter so much that if any verse is longer than Jesus wept, I won't be able to say it. So that one's mine. And the other boys agreed that that was going to be his, his verse that he said any time the principal stopped him, Jesus wept. And all during his life, he said that was the verse that he knew, Jesus wept. That was his memory verse. And we all just kind of giggled and laughed about it. But I began to think about it. Obi was born in the early 1900s. He had lived through World War I, he lived through a great pandemic that Obi had raised his family during the Great Depression, that he lived during World War II. And I began to think, you know, as a life verse, Jesus wept. Jesus wept was, was incredibly appropriate for Obi, that Jesus is the one that, that heals our pain and he's also the one that feels our pain. That Jesus didn't, didn't rise from the grave and say, hey, look, everybody, no scars. He said, place your finger in my hand, place your hand in my side. That there really was a cross, there really were nails, there really was a spear, that there really is suffering. That a life with joy, a life with power, isn't a life without pain. That it's a part of the journey. It's a part of what we do. And Jesus wept because the, the one who heals our pain is the one who feels our pain. Hebrews chapter 2.18 says, And now Jesus can help those who are tempted because he himself suffered and was tempted. This morning, I don't know where you are and I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what the battles are. But I do know that the one who heals our pain is the one that feels our pain. And that he's been through, through battles. He's been where you are. And this day, this day we, we have a choice. A choice. A choice to, to invite him, to ask him, to side by side, in us and around us, as close as our very own breath, to help us fight those battles. You're not alone. You're not alone. His name is Jesus, and he fights the battles 
with us, not for us, but with us. Choose to fight the battle on the, the outside. Choose to fight the battle on the inside. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is choose. Choose to trust God for the results. That's what Joshua is doing right here. He's gotten to the end of the 30 battles. He's looking back on his life. And he's seen that God's been with him every step of the way. Read a story about San Diego Chargers, that's a football team, that many years ago that they were struggling. They got a new quarterback, which they had a lot of hope in. His name was Dan Fouts. Well, he wound up being a, a, a Hall of Fame quarterback, but in those first several years he was with San Diego Chargers, he was struggling, and he was struggling a lot. Well, in one of those games that Fouts was struggling, the, the Chargers were behind two touchdowns. There was only two minutes left to go, and the coach got exasperated. He pulled Dan Fouts out, and in his place, he put backup quarterback Bobby Douglas. Well, as Bobby Douglas was running onto the field, he got about halfway to the huddle, and he turned around and came back to the coach, and he said, hey, coach, I know there's two minutes left, and we're two touchdowns behind. Do you want me to tie it, or do you want me to win it? <laughs> well, that's confidence. That's incredible confidence. And that word confidence, I think, is, 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 a, is a word that helps us out a lot. That the word is made of, of two words in Latin, con meaning with and fide meaning faith. Often we think of that word confidence as, as having a trust in another person, in the, the abilities of another person. But that's not the way we look at that word faith. Well, it's the same word. Often we look at the word faith as, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll just have faith. And we equate faith with ignorance. And so whenever we see that, that, that word faith throughout the Bible, well, it's kind of a, a wishful trust that we're hoping in hope and, and nothing else. No, this is confidence in a person. And that person's name is Jesus Christ. That Jesus is Lord. He was the Lord in the Old Testament and he's Lord today. He's the one who's fought those battles and we can lean on him. We can trust him. We can have confidence in him. We can have faith in him. Galatians 2.20 says, for, I've not, for I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the faith, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. It's a trust and a confidence. Well, often we think that trust and that confidence comes at the end of life. That it, that it comes when life is tested in the, life's, in the last breath. But most often... It comes not at the end of life. It comes at the beginning of every day. When all our dreams, all our hopes, all our fears, all our aspirations comes rushing at us at the first of every day. And that's when we choose. Not at some time off in the future. Not sometime one day, but this day. Did we choose this day who will serve? This morning, it may be that you've never made a conscious choice to serve Jesus as the Lord, the one that leads your life, the one that's, that is the God of your life. You might have, have said, okay, well, you know, I, I, I believe in God, I, I, and it's a, a general feeling of, of, of warmth toward God, but you've not let him lead your life. Or it may be that a long time ago that you, you chose to follow him, but you've gotten off the path. He provides strength this day. It's a new day. It's a day to choose whom we will serve, who we will follow, who we will go to battle with, in our heart of hearts, and in the everyday, in the ordinary. 
Pray with me. Jesus, this day, give us strength to choose who we'll serve, that we serve you as the Lord, as the leader, as the one who gives strength that we don't have. Lord, there may be folks here this day battling all kinds of things. It may be a fear that's conquered them again and again and again. Maybe they haven't called on you. Or maybe this is the day that they lean on your strength and that it's, it's one step in a new day, one step in a, in a new way following you. Breathe on us gathered here that we may know that strength. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you want to see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 1115 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.